The Norwich Society's usual programme of talks and tours is currently on hold, but we have replaced in-person events with an online offer. The historian's talks can now be seen on our YouTube channel with links on our website. You can also download self-guided trails on the Exploring Norwich page, encouraging you to discover more about Norwich on your own. For those of you who would like a taster or current, cannot currently get out, we are launching our Exploring Norwich videos. This first one looks at the various building phases that have shaped Norwich through the centuries. Norwich is a beautiful city to live in. It has been shaped over the centuries and has avoided up to now the wholesale development that has erased so much of the past in other towns and cities. Time has been kind to Norwich, and this is my personal journey through the centuries. Norwich was mined for chalk and flints from the Middle Ages until the beginning of World War II. The chalk was used for liming in agriculture and in mortar for building. Flints were used to build the city walls and some of Norwich's finest buildings. Initially, chalk and flints were excavated from open holes, creating steep escarpments like those shaping Ketz Heights. But then tunnels were started from the side of the resulting pit, following the richest seams of flints. Tunnels have been found adjacent to Rosary Road and Chalk Hill Road, which were used as shelters during World War II. Norwich is riddled with old chalk workings, as can be seen by this bus in the Earlham Road in 1988. Flints are shaped in a laborious and highly skilled process of chipping away until you get the shape wanted. The Museum of Norwich at the Bridewell is housed in an early merchant's house built in 1370. It has had a varied history as a Bridewell or prison for women and beggars from the 16th to 19th century until the new city jail was built and it was then a shoe factory. The wall you are looking at is the best example of precision flint work in Norfolk. Flint embellished with stone was also used for churches. Norwich contains the largest collection of medieval churches in Northern Europe. By 1450, the city already had almost 60 churches. Many of them were funded by the emerging wealthy merchant class. Flint was combined with dressed stone to create wonderfully decorative effects known as flush work, a technique developed in Norfolk which uses hard to come by freestone to edge panels of the more readily available napped flint. The Ethelbert Gate leading into the Cathedral Close was built in about 1316 and replaces an earlier gate damaged in riots of 1272. The wonderful detail makes this one of the most important examples of flush work. The coming of the Normans in the late 11th century brought a new style of building that relied on imported stone from Caen in France. Norwich Castle was built in 1120 on top of an earlier earth defensive mound. What we see now is just the keep, the high point of a much larger defensible structure. Now it towers over the modern city. The exterior looks suspiciously well preserved because it was refaced in the 1830s largely following the original design, but actually using fewer castellations, nine to a side rather than the original 13. Norwich Cathedral was founded in 1096 by the first Bishop of Norwich, Herbert de Lozinger. In order to create the new cathedral, priory and precinct, several existing churches and many homes were destroyed in tombland. Norwich Cathedral cloisters are reputedly the largest surviving monastic cloisters in England and a haven of calm and peace. The buildings associated with the cathedral help create the character of Norwich. The cathedral precinct or close is the largest to survive in England and also has the largest number of residential houses within it. These houses range from 18th century townhouses to homes converted from what remained of the 14th and 15th century monastic buildings. Pools Ferry is the water gate for Norwich Cathedral. 
This is where the stone from Caen in France that was used to build the cathedral was delivered. In the 15th century, an arch gateway was built across the canal and the current ferry house was built a century later. The house was used as an inn, but also as a home for a ferryman carrying people across the Wensum. The canal was filled in around 1780 and the ferry operated until 1943. The Adam and Eve is widely claimed to be the oldest pub in the city and was possibly used by the workmen building the cathedral. The pub we see today is a 17th century building constructed from brick and flint with later additions. Stone was also the choice of our second cathedral. St John the Baptist Cathedral on Earlham Road was constructed between 1882 and 1910 to designs by George Gilbert Scott Jr, son of the great Gothic revivalist of the same name. It was originally a parish church dedicated to John the Baptist and built on the site of the Norwich City Jail. The design emulates 13th century early English Gothic. The funding was provided by Henry Fitzalan Howard, 15th Duke of Norfolk, as a gift to fellow Catholics in Norwich. In the 13th century, Norwich started to become very wealthy and needed the means both to protect itself and levy taxes on the increasing number of goods entering the city. In 1252, Norwich was granted royal permission to construct a defensive ditch and bank. This proved inadequate to protect Norwich from marauding barons from Ely, so the walls were begun in 1294. They consisted of a high flint wall and a deep outer ditch. There are some 40 flint towers and 12 gateways connected by high level walkways. You can see that the modern city still conforms to the medieval street pattern with the inner ring road following the line of the walls, except in the north. In the absence of local stone, the city walls were made of flint. When completed, they formed the longest circuit of urban defences in Britain, eclipsing even those of London. Today, only fragments remain. On the east side of the city, where there was no wall because this side was protected by the river, the Bishop's Bridge was defended by a gatehouse. This was dismantled in the late 18th century as its weight was damaging the bridge. The bridge was under threat again in 1923 when the city wanted to widen it as this was one of the main roads into Norwich. The Norwich Society was set up by some concerned citizens to oppose this and the Society has subsequently campaigned for many of Norwich's historic structures. Just along from Bishop Bridge, a brick and flint tower, the Cow Tower, was added to the defences at the end of the 14th century. This stood alone on the river and was designed solely as an artillery platform. The defences provided a useful control over the movement of goods in and out of the city through the gates where they were easily taxed. The new restrictions did not go down very well with people living in the villages around who had previously been able to go in and out of the city freely. The boom towers fulfilled the same function on the river as the main gates through the walls. They provided control over the movement of goods in and out of the city where they could be taxed. Vessels were prevented from entering Norwich by two great chains of Spanish iron until the tax was paid. Four old pence, or about nine pounds today, for a ship of bulk, and two old pence for others. It is surprising how many buildings in Norwich are actually associated with crime and punishment. Norwich Castle started life as a royal palace, visited by Henry I in 1121, but almost immediately became the county jail until 1887. Here you can see one of the current proposals to recreate the royal interior of the keep. The castle was used as a prison for felons and debtors from 1220, with additional buildings constructed on the top of the mound next to the keep. These buildings were demolished and rebuilt at the end of the 18th century by Sir John Soane, and more alterations were made in 1820. The use of the castle as a jail ended in 1887 when it was bought by the city of Norwich to be used as a museum. The conversion was undertaken by Edward Bourbon and the museum opened in 1895. The evidence of the jail is still visible, not only in the layout of the modern galleries, but also in the spiral staircase and tunnel that links what was the jail with the Victorian courtroom in the Shire Hall at the base of the mound. In 1887, prisoners were removed from the castle to a purpose-built jail on Plumstead Road, 
behind Britannia Barracks. The cow tower, already mentioned, was built originally as a toll house and prison by the prior of the cathedral sometime after 1249, before becoming part of the city's defences. The undercroft underneath the guild hall at, on Jail Hill acted as, as the city jail from the beginning of the 15th to the end of the 16th century. From then until 1826, the jail occupied premises opposite the guild hall in a building which had formerly been the Lamb Inn. In 1826, the prisoners were moved to a purpose-built prison outside St Giles' Gates, on a site now occupied by the Roman Catholic Cathedral. The jail was closed in 1878 and prisoners were moved to the county jail at the castle. Bishopsgate, of St Martin at Palace Plain, dates from the 1430s and contains a garderobe which would house prisoners. The Bridewell, now housing the Museum of Norwich, started out in 1370 as a merchant's house. From the 16th to the 19th century, it acted as a bridewell or prison for women, particularly unmarried mothers and beggars, until the new city jail was built. Local philanthropist Elizabeth Fry was a major driving force behind new legislation to make the treatment of prisoners more humane, and she was supported in her efforts by Queen Victoria. Medieval Norwich was the second city in England and extremely wealthy. Merchants built themselves grand houses, many of which still stand today. Wool was the source of Norfolk's wealth in past centuries. One of the causes of Kett's rebellion was the enclosure of common land so that wealth wealthy landowners could graze more sheep. In the 1570s to the 90s, a law was passed that all Englishmen, except nobles, had to wear a woolen cap to church on Sundays, part of a government plan to support the wool industry. The Burying in Woolen Acts of 1666 to 1680 required the dead, except plague victims and the destitute, to be buried in pure English woolen shrouds to the exclusion of any foreign textiles. The wool weaving, spinning, dyeing and finishing trade in East Anglia was the financial backbone of the region until the late 17th century. Merchants built themselves grand houses which also operated as trading places. Strangers Hall on Charing Cross is one of Norwich's oldest buildings dating to 1320, formerly the home of Sir Nicholas Southerton, Mayor of Norwich, who gave refuge to the strangers who were cloth weavers from Holland and Belgium in the 16th century. Dragon Hall in King Street is a unique survival of an early 15th century merchant trading hall, now enjoying a new identity as the National Centre for Writing. This half-timbered house was built for Augustine Steward, three times Mayor of Norwich between 1540 and 1556. The Earl of Warwick used it as one of his headquarters during Kett's Rebellion in 1549. John and Margaret Paston had a, had a house on Elm Hill where some of the Paston letters were probably written. However, this house was destroyed in 1507 and the present house on the site, now occupied by the Strangers Club, was built after the fire by Sheriff of Norwich and three times Mayor Augustine Stewart. The music house in King Street is thought to be the oldest surviving house in Norwich. The first element of the building is a two-storey structure at right angles to King Street, started in the early 12th century. In 1175, the building was extended along King Street. Sir John Paston bought the building and remodelled it in 1488. It's got its name during the Elizabethan period, when the city's official band of musicians practised there. The Norwich Waits were a famous band of five musicians who all lived in King Street and were presented with their instruments by Elizabeth I, who visited Norwich in 1578. In the 18th century, the building was purchased by Young, Crawshay and Young's, one of the city's big four breweries, as it was adjacent to their Crown Brewery, and they used it as a pub for the next 150 years. Elm Hill is the most complete Tudor street in the city. A major fire destroyed most of the buildings in 1507, but the properties were rebuilt. During the medieval period, it was the epicentre of society, with 16 mayors and sheriffs living there. Because of the threat of fire, thatch was discouraged, but there are still a few survivors. Here you can see Pickerel's House on Rosemary Lane, Britain's Arms on Elm Hill, a textile weaver's house in Lion and Castle Yard off Timber Hill, 
the Hermitage on Bishopgate, 20 Wesselgate, formerly the Barking Dicky Inn, and the Pink House in St Swithin's Alley. But behind the medieval magnificence, it was a very different story. Courts and yards were built behind the great houses to house the many workers that flooded into Norwich. The courts and yards have now been demolished or gentrified, but there are numerous drawings and photographs showing what they looked like. The yards lasted until after World War I, when the city instigated a programme of slum clearance. What was gained in hygiene was perhaps lost in picturesqueness. Thomas Ivory was the most influential architect in Georgian Norwich. In 1751, he was appointed as carpenter at Norwich's Great Hospital, where he was responsible for building maintenance, a position he retained throughout his life. He built a grand house for himself in 1756, St Helen's House, adjacent to the Great Hospital. Work on the octagon began in 1754 and the building was opened in 1756. Ivory's design proved so popular that it was used as a model for subsequent Methodist meeting houses across Europe. The assembly house was reconstructed from existing buildings in 1755 by Thomas Ivory and became a focal point for cultural events in the Regency period. Madame Tussaud exhibited waxworks here and composer Franz Liszt gave a concert recital. The interiors were designed by Sir James Burroughs, Master of Gonville and Keyes College, Cambridge. Here you can see what the assembly rooms would have looked like in their heyday. The new Theatre Royal followed in 1758, based on Drury Lane in London. Ivory operated the theatre himself and is recorded as having obtained a licence for his company of actors, the Norwich Company of Comedians, to perform in Norwich in 1768. Michael Blackwell goes into more detail about the history of Norwich's theatres in the 18th century in his video talk for the historians, viewable on the Norwich Society's website. Ivory House, All Saints Green, was built in 1771. This became the Militia Barracks in 1860 and subsequently the Artillery Barracks. Other ele elegant examples of Thomas Ivory's work can be seen at St Catherine's House, All Saints Green and 29 to 35 Surrey Street. You can also get an idea of domestic Georgian elegance in the dining room at Strangers Hall. Strangers Hall is primarily a Tudor building, but part of it was redesigned in the latest style when it became the official residence of the Assize Judges in 1748. The 19th century saw industrialisation start to change the face of the city. Norwich was a centre of weaving as early as 1174, but by the 1670s, 50% of free men were connected with the textile trade. Weavers had hitherto worked at home to produce cloth, which was then passed to a merchant for sale. There are still a few houses that have the characteristic large attic windows that provided enough light for the weavers to work. With the invention of mechanised weaving machines powered by fast flowing rivers in the north of England, Norwich's weaving industry went into decline. St James's Mill was built in the 1830s in response to the crisis in the weaving trade. It had a short-lived and unsuccessful career as a centre for mechanised weaving before being used for other trades. Local architect Edward Boardman had a great impact on Victorian Norwich, meeting the needs of the new industrialists. The Boardman practice continued under his son E.T. Boardman until 1966. From 1868, Boardman lived and worked in premises off Queen Street, next to what briefly had been a branch of the Bank of England. By 1875, with a growing business and a large family, he moved his home to the New Market Road. The office was altered and given a Gothic frontage. When the textile trade failed, a new industry developed which could take advantage of the thousands of skilled workers. In the years leading up to World War II, 
the Norwich boot and shoe trade employed over 10,000 people, a staggering 15% of the total workforce, making it the city's premier industry. Sadly, almost all of those employers have now gone, but they have left a legacy of impressive buildings that have, in most cases, been converted to other uses. Howlett and White Limited, or Norvik, shoe factory in St George's, was designed by Edward Boardman in 1876. The original building was extended in 1894. Part of it now houses the Jane Austen College. The Royal Hotel replaced an earlier Royal Hotel on Gentleman's Walk. It boasted luxurious decorations and all modern conveniences. Each floor was supplied with two sets of closets and bathrooms, one for gentlemen and the other for ladies. It closed as an hotel in the 1970s, but there are plans to reintroduce hotel accommodation on the upper floors. Norwich is proud to be the home of the best-selling regional newspaper in England. On the 6th of September 1701, the Norfolk Post, the earliest truly provincial English newspaper, was published by Francis Burgess. The EDP was founded in 1870 as a broadsheet called the Eastern Counties Daily Press, and it changed its name to the Eastern Daily Press in 1872. At the end of the 19th century, the EDP acquired Pig's Warehouse, a large site on the north side of London Street, which enabled the newspaper to bring the publishing and printing sides under one roof. The printing workshops have now largely disappeared, but the London Street elevation, which was designed in 1899 by Edward Boardman, is still intact. You can read about all these buildings and many others in the Norwich Society's book on Boardman, which is available from Gerald's or the City Bookshop, which does mail order. George Skipper overlapped with Boardman and took over the baton in developing the face of Victorian and Edwardian Norwich by creating lavish premises for the new types of business. His work is characterised by an exuberant style. He built these offices for himself in 1896 and they're now part of Gerald's. This panel on the facade features Skipper with his family and a client. In the background are three of his buildings. The Norfolk Daily Standard offices, Surrey House and Commercial Chambers. Haymarket Chambers were built for the grocer J. H. Roof with his shop on the ground floor and the offices above, first occupied by the Norwich Stock Exchange. Gerald's already occupied the premises in London and Exchange Streets when Skipper was asked to remodel the building. It is characterised by Skipper's inventive use of traditional architectural styles. Banking and insurance became big business in the 19th century. Surrey Street was the site of the Duke of Surrey's mansion in the 16th century, hence the street name. The mansion was demolished and George Scripper was commissioned to build a new headquarters for Norwich Union, beginning in 1900. The interior is a sumptuous homage to the English Renaissance. The marble hall is fashioned from 15 kinds of marble, which were destined for Westminster Cathedral. The cost proved too much for the cathedral authorities, but Skipper persuaded Norwich Union to buy the entire consignment and he used it to stunning effect. The Norwich and London Accident Insurance Association in St Giles is housed in another bravura building in the monumental Baroque style, more Rome than Norwich perhaps. This handsome building is in London Street. In past centuries, public health depended on private benefaction or the church. One of the oldest surviving buildings is the Lazar House. Most of the city gates had places to house lepers outside the city walls. This was to prevent contagion, but also lepers were well placed to beg for alms. The Lazar House was originally founded before 1119 by Bishop Herbert de Lozinger as a hospital for male lepers and poor sick. The hospital closed in 1547 and was then used as agricultural cottages. It was saved from demolition in 1902, restored and gifted to the city when it became the first Norwich branch library. The Great Hospital was founded in 1249 by Bishop Walter de Suffield to provide care for poor aged priests, poor scholars and sick and hungry paupers. 30 beds were earmarked in the west end of the church for the sick poor and 13 paupers were to be fed at the hospital gates each day. Mary Chapman founded the Bethel Hospital in 1713 
as the first purpose-built asylum in the country which heralded a more humane approach to the treatment of mental illness. It initially housed 30 inmates. Over the centuries, the treatment of those with mental illness was transformed, and during the late 19th century, formal gardens, a croquet lawn, bowling green and tennis courts were provided for the recreation of patients. The original building has been extended many times. In 1899, Edward Boardman inserted a new block onto the Bethel Street frontage, parallel to the original house. The Norfolk and Norwich Hospital was founded in 1771 and designed by Thomas Ivory as a charitable institution for the care of the poor and the sick. By 1874, rapid population growth meant that the hospital was too small and Edward Boardman was commissioned to extend and remodel the hospital with the first phase opening in 1881. The 20th century was a time of great change. World War II bomb damage, demolition of poor housing and road widening meant that many historic buildings were demolished to make way for a modern city. Haymarket is one area that has been completely transformed, exchanging quaint buildings as seen in the 19th century with new shops and a celebration of the life and work of renowned scholar Sir Thomas Brown. A complete street was demolished parallel to Chapelfield in the 1960s to create the Inner Ring Road. Something that Norwich does really well is to repurpose old buildings or extend them in a contemporary style. The Norwich School of Design was founded in 1845 by the artists and followers of the Norwich School of Painters to provide high quality designers for local industry. It has evolved into Norwich University of the Arts. The newer campus is made up of 10 buildings and facilities in and around St George's Street in the centre of Norwich. The campus is characterised by the ultra-modern conversion of some of Norwich's most significant historic buildings. Here you can see the City of Norwich Technical Institute building in St George's Street, which houses a large element of the university. It was built by the Corporation of Norwich in 1899 as a school of science and art and for technical instruction applicable to trades and manufactures. The East Garth Photography Building off St George's Street is part of the remains of the medieval Blackfriars monastic complex. Gunton's Building, St George's Street, was built in 1914 for Gunton's builders and plumbers merchants. Between the 1920s and 1975, shoemakers were trained in this building. It was built in the early 18th century as a workshop and store. Edward Boardman had more effect on the appearance of Norwich than perhaps any other architect. His name lives on in Boardman House, the church rooms he designed, along with the Congregational Chapel in 1879. In 2015, this building was imaginatively refurbished by Newer to house the School of Architecture and won one of the Norwich Society's Design Awards. The University of East Anglia was established in 1963 and is characterised by its many significant contemporary buildings, but its history includes some more traditional settings. A discrete metal plaque on number four Cathedral Close states that the UEA began here in 1961. In October 1963, Earlham Hall and its gardens became the home of the newly opened University of East Anglia, housing the Vice-Chancellor and administration. The house dates to the late 16th century with numerous later editions, including some in the 20th century by Edward Baldwin. It now houses the UEA Law Department. Its refurbishment won the Norwich Society Design Award for Conservation in 2015. The famous ziggurats were designed by Dennis Lansdon and opened a student accommodation in 1966. The Bainsbury Centre for Visual Arts was designed by Norman Foster and contains a steep teaching space as well as a major art collection. Its uncompromising modern style means that it is in demand as a futuristic film set. Film credits include acting as the new headquarters of the Avengers in Avengers Age of Ultron 2015 and it also starred in Spider-Man Homecoming in 2017. Norwich Cathedral has commissioned two stunning replacements of ruined monastery buildings.
The Gerald Bridge literally bridges the old and the new, providing a link between the contemporary Riverside offices and the cathedral. Norwich is regularly in the top 10 UK shopping destinations. Despite the gloomy forecast for the future of the high street, Norwich has always been a popular and prestigious shopping destination. The name Tombland comes from two Old English words meaning open ground or an empty space. This area was used as the main marketplace for Norwich and was the centre of activity before the Normans arrived in England in 1066. It is now undergoing a major revamp. Norwich Market was established by the Normans in the early 12th century and it continues to be a bustling shopping hub. It is the largest six day market in the UK and won the Great British Market Awards in 2019. The surrounding buildings have changed over the years, but the market is still recognisable. Gentleman's Walk was the premier shopping street in the 17th century when it got its name. London Street was the first street in England to be pedestrianised in 1967. The Royal Arcade was designed by George Skipper in 1899 and built on the coaching yard of the Old Royal Hotel. It retains the Old Royal's frontage on Gentleman's Walk. Into Chapelfield, now called Chantry Place, and Castle Mall provide more contemporary indoor shopping experiences. Norwich was once the second city in England and its civic buildings are evidence of its importance. The Guildhall is the largest medieval city hall in England and fulfilled that function until 1938 when the modern city hall was built. Opened in 1938, City Hall boasts the longest balcony in England at 111 metres. It still has much of its original Art Deco furniture and furnishings. The Forum was built in 2001 to replace the Old County Library and Record Office. There were some initial concerns that it was too big for the site, but it is, an, it is now a well-loved venue and meeting place. Major building projects are still shaping our city. This futuristic plan was never put in place, but there is an increasing emphasis on creating sustainable buildings which take account of concerns about the environment. The City College Creative Art, Arts Buildings includes numerous low energy and sustainable systems. It won one of the Norwich Society's Design Awards in 2015. The Enterprise Centre is, is an exemplary modern working and event and teaching space. The timber frame and straw cladding help reduce its carbon footprint and promote the use of renewable materials. It is the largest exterior thatch building in Europe. It won the Norwich Society Design Award for a community building in 2017 and went on to win a Civic Voice Design Award in the Housing and New Build category in 2018. The most recent development is Goldsmith Street, a social housing estate comprising 194 dwellings built to passive house standard, which reduces the amount of energy needed to maintain a comfortable environment. It has now won numerous awards. So that completes my talk and I hope you've enjoyed it and will be encouraged to explore for yourselves. Don't forget that you can download self-guided trails and historians talks from the Norwich Society website and you can see the links there.